unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. There is something about the presence of Almighty God. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, your prayer. Somebody tell him Jesus.
Oji I want you to give the Lord a mighty hand clap of praise. Come on, clap for Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Uh, I was prompted to finish the other, the third part I promised. How many of you remember? Uh, yes. So if you missed the last Thursday and the other Thursday, I advise you, get those sermons in order. You will love it. We were giving uh, a simple answer to a certain question. And the question then has been all through. So, many people were asking, why is it that I, I pray a lot, I fast a lot, I do all these things a lot, but certain things in, the, in my life are not working, okay? Probably your finances are messed up, probably your relationship is messed up, probably uh, your, 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 your education is messed up, and you're not getting results like you should. The first time I taught, about, I, I taught about the tongue and how to maintain the power of your confession, the right way to confess. The, sec, the last time I was speaking about the heart. And today I'm also going to build something around there. Praise God and finish this because it's important. I, I thought I would push it ahead, but the Lord kept on imprinting it in my spirit to finish it. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there's a reason. Hallelujah. I see some two empty seats there. What, do they belong to some people? Come on. Ashes, people are standing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So I felt in my spirit that um, we needed to... Yes? What has God done for you? Elsa, you're healed. Eh? Somebody clap for Jesus. God bless you. Hallelujah. He's still healing. He's still healing. So I was telling you that um, many people ask me, why don't I see results? That's why from today when people come and say, I'm praying, things have refused to work, I'll be referring them to those three. Even you refer them. I was telling people that we want to push people away from the babysitting of counseling every Wednesday, coming for prayers when the word is there. The word is your counselor. Isn't it? The Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Even Jesus didn't cancel. He told. So, so it's important. It was okay for us to carry some of you up to that level. But many of you now have graduated. You don't even know it yet, some of you. But many of you now, once you have the word, it is enough. Praise the Lord. The beauty with the word is, it is not limited to the sermon you're listening to. Because it's the word. Play any, any sermon when you're disturbed. Why? Because the Bible says every scripture is profitable. 
The Bible didn't say only all. It said every scripture is profitable. In other words, there are certain things that don't look like are particular to your situation. Hallelujah. Read it. 2 Timothy 3.16. The Amplified says, Every scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration, and profitable for what? Instruction and for reproof and conviction of sin, for correction of error, discipline in obedience, for training in righteousness, conformity to God's will in thought and purpose. One scripture, every scripture can do all that. You can read in the beginning and the tumor leaves you. Because every scripture is profitable. Not a few of them. Not 25 scriptures. Not 23 scriptures. Not particular scriptures. No. That is why I tell people, when you enter into the word thing, listen every time. Switch on even when... You, you just switch on and let the thing play. Let it just play. You don't know what you're sorting in your life. Why? Because that's what his word is. Hallelujah. That's what his word is. 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 Praise God. So I wanted to finish this other part. I don't see results. I don't see results. I talked about the heart and how to guard it last time before. I was talking about the tongue to down to talk about the wound. The wound. The wound. Hallelujah. Why? Because one time I was praying for a couple of people. Sometimes I have my few special moments where I just put some people before God. Not because they pay me or because they should even know, but because it's the responsibility of every priest to pray for his own. That has to be. You have to pray for your own. Okay? And for some reason, that I would pray for, and in the spirit I would see barren wombs. Right? Barren wombs. In the sense that the seed can come and it's right. Luke 8, 11. The parable is that the seed is the word. But if it enters a barren womb, what happens? Are you hearing me? Because the seed there is the Greek word spermatos, which is sperm, right? What if a man gets together with his wife and the wife is barren? What happens? Do they produce child? No. So sometimes the problem is not that the seed that is coming out is not right. Sometimes the womb that is receiving it is not right. And if we don't fix those wombs, many people won't see results as they ought to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I understand what you're saying. I yes. I see a few seats there. Ushers. I'm not supposed to be ushering. I see one, a few seats there. Come on. You're interrupting my preaching. It's not fair that people are standing and there are a few seats there. It's not my job. Unless you want to pay me. Hallelujah. <laughs> are we together? So, it, the parable is that the seed is the word. That means every time the word of God comes, it comes like a seed, right? Like a sperm, you know, married people. And every time it finds the right womb, it must produce. It must produce results. But if the seed is right, like in the beginning, if your word is right, you're speaking and confessing the right words. Are we together? But the womb is funny, you will not get the results that you need. So today I want to touch this whole issue of conception. Conception, generally speaking, is the beginning of life. Hallelujah. It's the what? It's the beginning of life. It is the beginning of life. Anything called conception means that there are two things that are getting together to create life. Praise the Lord Jesus. Let me read for you something. Let's first open Psalms 36 verse 9. I need to first open a certain uh, mind to you before I start. Psalms uh, 36 verse 9. Uh, let's read. One, two, three, let's go. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy life we shall see light. Read it again. For in thee is the fountain of life. In thy light we shall see light. Read it one more time. For in thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light we shall see light. Now, many of you have read the Bible, and you know that the Bible says that the entrance of your word brings light. Alright? When the word of God is shed, is sent out to your spirit, the first thing the words come, the Bible says they give light, and it giveth understanding to the simple. The moment the gospel is preached to you, you're illuminated. Okay? But that's not your end. 
That's not your end. The Bible says, with thee is the fountain of life. And it says, in thy light, you see when the word comes, in thy light, the Bible says, we shall see light. He gives a situation, a circumstance, where a child of God is illuminated by a certain scripture. And once that scripture hits your spirit, you start to see other things in that scripture. Are we together? You start to see other things in that scripture. How would you get them? I'll give you an example. If you switch on light, okay? This is, for example, a phone. And you switch on light. It's light. This is the one, okay? The light comes and hits here. But it doesn't mean that you can see the phone, right? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's an experience where it takes also another form of light to unveil deeper things therein. To see more lights in the gospel. How together? That's the essence of revelation. The Bible says they reveal things belong unto us. The hidden things are of the Lord. But whatever is revealed of God, it belongs to you. Whatever is apocalypse, it, whatever the Lord unveils, he says this is yours. Now the transition of that to leave the spiritual realm and then coming to manifest in the flesh. That's the funeral experience. The mind that says, I have something out there and I want it to be translated into something to be seen. Because many of you have a possession of things. Right? But those things in the spirit don't represent and are not represented physically. It's so frustrating when you feel something you don't see. Do you, do, do, you, do you get my point? It is a very frustrating experience to feel like you, you, you are something but you don't experience it. That's the essence of why we teach. To not only uncover this, but also to help you get it from that realm and then put it physically and then have results. Somebody say amen. So when the Bible says that in thine light we shall see light, it means that I want to take you to a certain perspective of entering into a deeper line. Because some of you, when I say womb, some of you only think about the physical womb. In fact, in the, in the Hebrew, there are like two definitions of the womb. There's a, womb, there's a definition called beten. And beten is translated as simply the interior of the womb, physically, right? But there's also a Hebrew word there, which is like reshem or rechem or raham. Some people translate it that way. But that word raham or reshem is the most literal definition of the word womb. And amazingly, it comes from the word raham which is translated from the true meaning, loved. How together? That means that every representation of the womb to God, or in many instances of the scriptures, there's a point where he speaks of the womb, but that womb in its own represents loved or beloved or loved most. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That is the basis for every womb. Okay? That is the basis for every womb. And I'm trying to make the first point here. When you are not perfected in the love of God, it is very hard to produce. Can I say it again? When you are not perfected in the love of God, it is very hard to what? To produce. Because this thing is telling you you're loved deeply. Every thing inside you you have that carries the ability to produce must be a reminder to you for God's love toward you. And him honoring his covenant of love toward you. When a man is not perfected in love, that man, that man will have problems receiving from God. Some people don't know the power of love until you experience it. They don't know the power of love until you what? You experience it. But there are many things in this life that are the way they are because many people have not understood the love of God. I'll give you an example. You all read the scripture. This is love made perfect. That you might have what? 
confidence on that day, the day when they say you have cancer, the day when they find HIV in your, in your, in your brother's blood, the day when they say that you're going to die. He says, for as he is, so are we in this world. The, the perfection of the love of God relates you to him. Are we together? So when a man is not perfected in the love of God, if you have not understood the love of God, the opposite of love is what? Come on. Come on. Fear. And the Bible says, and we receive not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but a spirit of love, power, and sound mind. Because the Bible says, for fear hath torment. That means that when a man carries a spirit of fear, you carry a spirit around you that will torment you. It's automatic. When you, you, you really amplify, give me the amplified of that, John 14. He says, there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full, grown, complete, perfect love, the womb, turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. The moment you, you fear, punishment comes. So some of the problems you have is not because they bewitched you or because you're failing in your life. No. The reason why you're failing is because you carry fear in your spirit. He says it comes with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love. is not grown into love's complete perfection. When you do not understand how much God loves you, it's easy for you to assume that certain things will happen to you. And the beginning of that assumption starts to attract all those things. Somebody say amen. amen. You must believe that God loves you too much to let certain things happen to you. Amen. Let me say it again. You must believe that God loves you too much to let certain things happen to you. Let me tell you, even parents, you have kids that annoy you, but there are certain things you can't allow to happen to them, even if they annoy you. Why do you assume that your heavenly father has less grace than you? Do you know how many parents would have killed their children long ago? But because you love your child, sometimes you say, no, okay, yeah, he's silly, but he's my child. She's a thief, but she's my daughter. Man, how much more your heavenly father? Listen, no man in this earth can love like God does. So, do you realize that it's even wrong to rebuke the spirit of fear. It's not what God has called us to do. He has called us to remind ourselves of His love. Of His love. Of His love. When situations happen around you, the, the first thing that the devil wants to do is, is to put fear in your spirit. Because he knows the moment fear comes, you're going to attract torment. And then you're going to come out of one problem entering another. Coming out of one problem entering another. Why? Because you are afraid. Stop to fear. Tell your neighbor, stop to fear. Tell him again. Stop to fear. You have to get to a point where nothing moves you. It doesn't matter what they say. Nothing moves you. It doesn't matter what they think about you. Nothing moves you. You even tell yourself, for me, nothing moves me. I'm not shaken by anything. That's supposed to be your first response. Oh yes, they are saying news is that and news is this. Yes, you refuse to believe. You just refuse to believe. You just refuse to believe. You just refuse to believe a wrong report. Jesus put it there. He says, whose report, regardless of your situation, whose report, regardless of what you did or what you didn't do, he says, whose report will you believe? You have to choose something. But some of you, they bring news and then the moment you hear that, you say, ah... I think I'm finished. I think I'm done. And then fear has torment. Fear has torment. Give me the message version. Fear has torment. He says there's no room in love for fear. No, it's not there. He says well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling. Fear cripples. It cripples. So you're not crippled because of a demon. No, you're crippled because of fear. That thing called fear. He says it's freedom. A fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is one not yet fully formed in love. 
Some people fear judgment. They fear, oh God, oh, this is going to happen. I fear, oh, this is going to happen. Oh God, oh, oh, you understand? And then they're living all their lives like that. And then you ask yourself, why do I have many problems? It's because you fear. Your tongue says it every day. Oh, Apostle, I don't know what I'm going to do. Now I've come for prayers, but Apostle, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Honestly, you don't know. The Bible says you have an action from on high. You know all things. You know all things. You know all things. Let me tell you, what you don't fear can't kill you. It cannot kill you. It cannot kill you. What you don't fear can't kill you. But let me tell you, even if you fear flu, it will kill you. It will kill you. It will kill you. Some people think death is having a very bad disease. No. They even told you in the morning, I said, no. He actually went to bed smiling, and the next day the guy died. What? There is a form of fear in certain individuals. Sometimes it's the words that you hear. It's the circumstances that you hear. That's why I'm very key with the issue of the message that you hear. The message. Sometimes the message is what creates fear. Some people, yeah, some people it's not that they have a problem, but the way you are taught, you are raised under the law. Every time they have to scare you, they tell you, Jesus, God is here. He's a forgiving God, but he's also a lion. He can come any time. You don't know the, the, the righteous indignation. But when you read the Bible, you're actually shocked. The Bible says, and the wrath of God is revealed, is sent to them which do not believe. To the, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. His wrath is to them which don't believe. His wrath is to them which don't believe. He says the wrath of God has been revealed. It's somewhere I think in Romans. I don't know. Let me see if I can get it for you. I think my brother here. There's the... Uh-huh. Yes. The Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You understand? Th- that is them. Now, when you believe the gift of righteousness, that it's freely imputed on you by faith in Christ, you're not among them. You, you walk out of them. I don't know that you get it. Give me the message version. Maybe it can bring it out well. Let me see. Yes. God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. Are you shielding truth? Are you against truth? Are you against truth? So why do you think that God God is going to be angry with you? Are you against truth? But let me tell you who are against truth. (laughs) People who disqualify the grace message. They, They are against truth. They are against truth. He says, my brethren, my heart's prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, have gone ahead to establish their own righteousness, refusing, (laughs) the Bible says, to submit themselves to the righteousness of God. Those ones, his anger will show. Have you refused the righteousness of God? You're in trouble. You're in trouble if you have. Me, I received it. Somebody say amen. amen. It's for unbelievers. A man who is against truth is an unbeliever. A man who is against righteousness, imputed freely, is an unbeliever. A man who tells you that you have to work out your righteousness in fear and in trembling, but forgets that the next line says, For God works in you, both to will and to do, according to his good pleasure. That man is an unbeliever. He disqualifies the work of the gospel and the cross, And then he puts himself in the ability and center of that work. To think that he has attained what he carries by his own strength instead of the strength of God. Why did Jesus die then? That's unbelief. That's unbelief. Some people think when we talk about the spirit of Antichrist, we talk about only guys who are like obvious, those funny jihadists who have swords. No, let me tell you. Antichrist, let me explain this. Antichrist is the spirit that disqualifies the finished work 
of Christ at the cross at Calvary. And it happens most in churches. Without even knowing. Without even knowing. Without even knowing. Without even knowing. Somebody can make a strange statement and say, uh, Saints, you have... Somebody one time said, Righteousness is given, but holiness is, is not given. It's not a gift. Somebody one time made that statement. I was hearing. So they said, Righteousness is a gift, but what about holiness? <laughs> and I told him, Look, the Bible says... That now that you are ashamed of those things which you used to do, now the fruit of righteousness. He spoke about the fruit. Righteousness has never been a seed. I mean holiness is not a seed. It's not a seed. It's a fruit. I am the vine and you are the branches. The seed is the word which is Christ. It's from whom all your strength comes and ability. And when it forms up in you, fruit comes. You understand? So, the same is with the fruit. He says, right, holiness. Your, your fruit, the Bible says, has come unto holiness. Holiness is a fruit. It's a fruit. It's the working of Christ in a man, not the man's ability. He says, but now being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness. Your fruit is just a fruit. It just comes out of you. Because of a particular message, the seed. Look at 11, the parable is that the seed is the word. That means if I preach the right message in a man, the fruit of holiness will come. So, it will not be incumbent on the man to act out that holiness. It will be entirely dependent on that fruit. I mean the seed planted in that man. When the seed is right, the results come out. That is why when he talks about the creature that you carry, which has put on Christ, <laughs> the Bible says, which has been what? Recreated or created in true holiness. True, true holiness. You see, you put on a certain image. That's the real thing that defines holiness. Not all these other things, what? Yeah, he says, and now, now you've put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That new man is created in true holiness. That means that there is a false holiness. It's the ability of a man without the righteousness of God coming on. But now when you put on that, give me the Amplified, give me the Amplified. He says you've put on the new nature, the regenerated self, created in God's image, God-like, in true righteousness and holiness. This nature is holy. It doesn't try to be holy. You don't tell it be holy. It's holy. Because it's of the nature. Holiness is a gene issue. It's not an appeal. If you're being appealed to be holy, then you're not yet born again. Because when you become born again, the Bible says you're begotten of the incorruptible seed, which liveth and abideth forever. So if in you is incorruption, you don't even try to be holy. Holiness is you. Holiness is you. Tell your neighbor I'm holy. Uh, oh yeah, bah. tell him I'm holy. And so I say, how do you say you're holy? Well, because holiness is a nature issue. It's, I'm regenerated. Tell your name, I'm regenerated. Give me the message. Tell your name, I'm regenerated. See, your new life is not just your old life. Eh? Work in itself, boss. I don't know where you are. Where, did, where was the new life thing? Uh-huh. Thank you. You've been regenerated. Not from a mortal origin sperm, but from one which is immortal. No, 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 no. I was looking at the other scripture in the message. Uh huh. The Bible says, can you probably go up before? It says that it's. Uh huh. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance. Everything I do, I mean everything. Connected with that old way of life has to go. It's shortened through and through God. Get rid of it and then take off an entirely. Sorry, take. Sorry, get rid of it and then take on an entirely new way of life. A God fashioned life. Okay? A life renewed from inside. It is renewed. You don't renew it. It's just renewed automatically. And the next verse says, and working itself into your conduct as God what? God what? God what? God what? God what? As God accurately reproduces his character in you. This is God's, this is God's mandate to reproduce his character in you. Your work is very simple. Only believe. Only believe. 
But then somebody refuses God's help to accurately reproduce his character in them, and then they try to do their own thing, and then they fail, and they ask themselves why they are failing to produce results. Simple. With the flesh, with the law, no flesh shall be justified. The moment you go under the law, your flesh, God will always prove to you, you can't. You can't. You'll fail every time until you allow God to work in you. Somebody say amen. Let me show you something in Numbers. When a person, Numbers 5.28. Numbers 5.28 says, And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free, and she shall conceive seed. How is she defiled? The next verse says, This is the law of jealousy. When a wife goeth aside to another instead of a husband. That is defilement. Jesus Christ is your husband as a church. But when you listen to another person, you become defiled. You become defiled. That's the law of jealousy. And what happens? An unclean. And what happens? You frustrate the ministry of conception. Conception refuses. When she's not defiled and she's clean, conception takes place. But when she's defiled and unclean, conception cannot play, take place. And sometimes this defilement comes through the words we hear on the pulpits every day. There are many things we hear and they defile the womb. They defile the womb. They kill you. They kill you. They kill you. The life of salvation, by the way, let me tell you something. The life of salvation versus the spirit of Antichrist representing itself as the gospel and the body of Christ is the opposite in the sense that this spirit wants to exert as much power through you to do in your own strength to achieve and then this one wants to reveal to you exactly and fully what God has done so that you simply rest in it. That is why some people read scriptures the other way around. You remember that scripture in Isaiah? That they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount on wings like eagles. Huh? They shall mount on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow away. And they shall walk and not faint. You know? When you look at that scripture, do you realize that God was not stupid to begin from flying? Now, read. They, now give this picture. Play it in your spirit. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount on wings like eagles, okay? And they shall run and not be weary and then walk. You see, this is, this is the motion of a man in effort coming down to rest. <laughs> they mount and then run and then they stop. And then they, I don't know whether you get the point. That strength leads you to rest. You mount on wings, you run, landing. And then you walk. And then you stop. Effortlessly. That's rest. That's rest. But some people begin it from walking. Then they run. <laughs> You'll understand one day. <laughs> but the right seed, praise the Lord, once it comes to conceive, in the right womb, it requires that a man be not defiled through the wrong message. The wrong message. Some people are what they are because of what they've had. Now, reversing them back to what is true is too hard. Because everything you're saying, you're speaking the opposite of everything they know. And if they're not humble, they can stay where they are. And not produce results and they die normal lives. Listen. God has not called us to be... You know, it's like, it's like these people who go to doctors. The other day I found a Christian thing. I thank God that I went to a doctor and they checked my body and they found everything normal. I told them, you have a problem. <laughs> Christians are not supposed to be normal. They're supposed to be super normal. <laughs> God is not normal. You're supposed to be super normal. The doctor is supposed to say, you're more than normal. <laughs> normal. Normal people and people. You're super normal. Super healthy. Not just healthy. Super healthy in the name of Jesus. You don't just have normal kidneys. You have super normal kidneys. 
You just don't have a normal heart. You have super normal heart. So when you go to the doctor, and then the doctor says, you're normal, tell me, ah, doctor, correct it, add the word super. Add, add the word super. Add the word super. Why? Because there is something your body can stand that no normal man can stand. There is something your body can undergo that no normal body can undergo. You are not a normal person. He says you are peculiar people. You know the meaning of peculiar? You are strange. 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 I hate being defined like a human being. You know some Christians, when they fall, they are quick to say, I'm also human. In every situation, I'm not a human being. Uh, those funny little guys, whoever they think they are what? No. What does the Bible say? You are a royal priesthood. A what? A peculiar people. Give me the message. He says, read it. Hey, yeah. Uh, you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people. God's instrument to do his work and speak out for him. To tell others of the night and day difference he made. As if for you on the world to tell people what God has done. You're strange. You're peculiar. Stop submitting yourself to, 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 to the dictates of humanity. Stop submitting yourself every time for you you want to believe. Even me, I'm a human. Even me, I'm a human. Even, listen. Listen to me. You have a choice. You can choose to believe that. You can choose to believe your super. In the name of Jesus. And the results around you will show. Human beings don't do miracles. Superhuman beings do miracles. That's my point. That is why when you listen to this word, you don't die like human beings. No. You die super. You go to heaven well. You go to heaven well. You, you finish well. Something on you starts to show that you're more than just a normal man. You're more than just a... If a man in the Old Testament, you remember the story? He says that when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, he says, and then you shall prophesy. And the Bible says in Samuel, and then you shall turn into another man. Not these normal ones. He says, and whatever the occasion serves thee. He says, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. Read. And thou shalt prophesy with them, and thou shalt be turned into another man. And he says, and let it be that when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serves thee, for God is with thee. So then I'll ask you the ultimate question. If a man in the Old Testament, the Spirit could just sit on him, and then he becomes another man. What about you in whom the Spirit dwells? Every day, every hour, the, he lives in you, he moves in you, in him you live, in him you move, and in him you have your own being. Tell your neighbor, I'm, I'm another man. I'm another man. I refuse to be submitted to the social status in the name of Jesus. I'm another man. I'm a better breed in the name of Jesus. I carry a better gene. In the name of Jesus. This is different. The Bible says that we are members of his body, his flesh and his bones. Why? We are members of his body, his flesh and his bones. We are members of his body, his flesh and his bones. Members of his body, his flesh and his bones. And then you come and tell me that you have cancer. Oh! No way. And if you are here and you are planning to get a sick prostate, change your mind. If you are planning to go for cervical cancer operation, change your mind in the name of Jesus. If you are planning to go for a heart transplant, I decree and I declare, the Bible says that the strength of the Lord is my heart. My heart can only fail if God fails. I refuse to be no more. I refuse to be no more. That is why we are going to redefine health statistics. People will say those guys, and we also don't know what is on them. Listen, Alexander Dowie healed men in Zalon, Illinois, until they closed hospitals, and then they turned hospitals into, into hotels. 
and, and doctors went plumbing in Zion, Illinois. And one time a doctor went there and he says, I want to start practice. And then one of the guys, the butlers, told him, you know what? In Zion, people here don't fall sick. It is possible. It is possible to send, to send diseases and drugs out of your house. You have kids every time. <laughs> Daddy, give me cow <laughs> No! 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 You get called for you tell the child, this is the last one you're taking, brother. You have to believe God for your health. You tell your child. Those are my things of, 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 let me tell you. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong, doctors. There are many people who are unbelievers. Hospitals, we need them. Because we need those people to be healthy until they become born again. Are you hearing me? So, doctors have their part. Don't get me wrong. But once you believe on the Lord Jesus, start to exercise it. Oh, I have a headache. Then you look at Panado Extra. No. First put yourself in a room and say, Rabakanda, Rabakaya. Zebaya, Rabakoya, Rabo, Zebatalaya. Ruboya. 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 That's the truth. Somebody goes to India and then they are taking a sick person. Then when they reach, they say, I tell you, you're going to die. We have to operate you now. Then they put them. Why? Because you're interested to know what's inside you. Because you don't know. Somebody asked me. Somebody asked me. Apostle Grace, why don't you go for annual checkups? I told them I know what's already inside. I have this treasure. <laughs> In earthen vessels. That the excellence <laughs> of power be of what? God. I have something. I know what's inside me. Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ. Now I check what? I check what? Some of you take yourselves like lambs to slaughter. Do you know? Listen. Follow the word. Diagonized. Diagnosis. Prognosis. Gnosko. Epignosis. <laughs> I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Diagnosis. Meaning that you've been phoned. They, they have phoned something in you. That's them finding are you hearing me? That's diagno. Prognosis. They're trying to what? To see how they fix it, right? Is that it? Now, gnosko is progressive knowledge. Epignosis is advanced knowledge. Now, diagno, epigno, they, they just don't rhyme. <laughs> I don't know that you understand what I'm trying to say. The Bible says you've been, you've put on the new man, which has been renewed in epignosis. Of him. Yo, this man has been, he is, he is, he is, he is, he is, he is a new, he's, he's, he is after a certain knowledge. He's after a certain knowledge. He carries advanced knowledge. He, you're put on a new man, which has been renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. That means that that, epi, that advanced knowledge always points to him. The man you carry has been renewed in the knowledge of him. Whether progressive, advancedly, every knowledge that you know about Christ, everything, this new man in you, just knows God. He just knows God and what he represents. So, that is what you behold every day. You see, you didn't come in this world to know cancer. This is eternal life. That you might know the one true God and his only son, Jesus. You didn't come in this world to... Some of you are cyberchondriacs. You know cyberchondriacs? They give you a disease, then you go on the internet, then you check it out. Then you get like a swelling in your, in your armpit, then you say, swelling in armpit. <laughs> You leave the Bible and go googling. 
May you start to read. Pain in, in left breast. Poor. Poor. <gasps> Then the next day, uh, we, I think you have it, uh, it's a cancer. <laughs> While you're reading Google, for us you are opening, I'm calm, that you might have life. <laughs> and life to the fullest, joy unspeakable, full of glory. For you, in you they are finding a new what? Disease. For us, we are finding health in the word. He says, listen, listen, listen. He says, these words are life that stem to them that what? Find it. And they are medicine to their bodies. For you, you are diagonizing Google. For me, I am reading the word. They are finding cancer in you. For me, I am finding life. And then you think we are going to be... He says... They are life unto those that find. While the doctor is looking into your blood, for us we are looking into ourselves. Looking into the gospel. Diagonizing gospel. Epignosizing gospel. Gnosizing gospel. Then you wonder why we are the ones who visit you in hospital. Not the other way around. Tell your neighbor, hey, hey, I'm not falling sick. Tell your neighbor, I'm not falling sick. Not this year. Not next year. Not in ten years. Forget about it. Tell your neighbor, my children can't fall sick. I cannot bury my children. In the name of Jesus. My body is healthy. Every organ in my body, it carries away. The life which is of God Himself. Sit down. Oh, Yababa. It doesn't mean we don't feel. Sometimes you can wake up and feel something. And then, then you, you could jogger it. You say, no. You're joking. I told people one time I woke up with a stupid temperature. I said, hey! What in the world is this? I just jeered at the devil. I covered myself. The body went back. You have to get to a point and tell the devil boss, I don't move by feeling. The Bible speaks of people who move by what? By feeling. They move by the senses. Whatever they feel. They say, ah, now I feel headache. Ah, I think I am sick. You possess it. <laughs> you, you, you feel headache. And then you say, I have a headache. <laughs> because you feel it. I don't possess what I feel. I possess what is in me. In Christ. I possess what I see. I conceive what I see. What I see is what I want. I conceive. That's what I see. You remember in Genesis study? You remember in Genesis study? When Laban robs of Jacob? Jacob just got animals, put them on water, and then they started mating. When they were mating, he got almond trees and then made them speckled. He put them there. You understand? Can you get me that? He put them there like this. And the Bible says, and when these animals were just drinking and then they saw speckled trees, they started to conceive speckles. These animals were not speckled. No. They were not producing after a gene. They were producing after what they saw. Hey, hey, hey. When you get that mystery, you can't produce stupid children. Oh. 
Uh uh-uh, uh, this guy is not where. Let me, let's look for it. It's somewhere there in Genesis 30. The time where he puts the what? The, the, the <laughs> I wish you understand me. The days of producing silly children have come to an end. <laughs> You remember when he used to get the almond? I wish I can get it, the, the trees of... Eh? I wish I could get it. Where he would used to put... Uh, while the animals... It's on the same chapter. While the animals were what? Were, were drinking water and they were mating. The, the brother can't find it. Let us help him. For those of you who want to keep it as a scripture. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Verse what? 37. You're smart. Thank you. Aha. Uh-huh. Begin from uh, verses 35, I think. Uh, no, okay. 36? Give me the message. So Jacob, Laban got all this. You know, he told him, how much will you pay me? He told him, state your wage. And then this guy says, give me all the spotted and speckled goats and sheep and all these things. This guy, what he did, he went before the guy and then got all the spotted, speckled and put them away. And then he put them three day journey between himself and Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob went on tending what was left as Laban's flock. There was no speckled and spotted. And the next verse says, And Jacob got fresh branches of poplar almond and plant trees and peeled the bark, leaving white stripes on them. And the Bible says, And he stuck the peeled branches in front of the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink. When the flocks were in heat, they came to drink. And the Bible says, and met it in front of the straight branches. Then they give birth to young ones that were straight. <laughs> and spoke, I, uh, like a don't take a day. You can't produce stupid children. <laughs> what you see is what you get. That's what I mean. <laughs> I don't know who I'm helping. I just delivered you from paying tuition to a child who is repeating class. Before you even marry, meditate your firstborn. Seeing that she's a bright child. Before you even get married, meditate your second born, how they are going to be. Meditate your third born, how they are going to be. Meditate your wife, your husband. Meditate! When conception takes place, what your eyes have seen will come out of the gene. Oh! Ho, 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 ho. That's the power of the word. That is the power of the word. That is why before you even... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Plan for your children right away. When you're pregnant, start to tell the child, When you're pregnant, you say, My child, look at the smart one. 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 You speak to your children about your children before you even get... Even before you even imagine... No, already put your children in first grade. Up there, top of the class. Come back home and start to act out your play. Hey, my child, you are the best already. You're always the first in class. I'm telling you, it's the truth. You come in our family, all my siblings, all their kids are clever. It's not we are confessing it, no. It's not a fake statement. All of them are smart kids. 90s, what? Yeah. As a family, we tell our children on family altars, Muriba Gezi, Muriba Gezi, Muriba Gezi, Muriba Gezi. But some of you are very tiny, Chisiru, Labo Musiru. Labo Labo Musiru, no Labo. You tell yourself Labo Musiru. You're abusing your kids. Some of you even imagine you produce stupid children. I hey, God help me not to produce a stupid child in a stupid woman. Let me tell you, even if the woman is stupid, put speckled trees. <laughs> I've seen clever people who have produced dense kids. Why? Because they didn't see. Tell your neighbor, I'm another man. Tell them again, I'm another man. Hallelujah. Hebrews 11:11. 11, 11. One time I shared about it. You know it. He says, "By faith." How does faith come? Through hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says, "Sarah herself received what strength to conceive seed that what delivered her a child." 
praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though she was past age, because she judged him faithful, who had, who promised. Look at how God puts it. Received strength to conceive seed to bear a child. You see that? The strength to conceive. The power to conceive is what brings the child. Is what brings the job. Is what brings the ministry. It's what brings the husband and the wife. It's what brings that child. It's the power to conceive. That means that this woman all her life was had a stupid barrenness. Her stomach, her womb was barren. It was barren. It had no strength to conceive. So Abraham puts seed, fails, goes to Hagar, Mama, once... <laughs> Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? But then the woman of the promise does not have what? But that's exactly what I'm trying to say. So what if she's barren? You carry the promise. So what if she's stupid? You carry the anointing. You don't worry. Some of you, some of you think you have to have to find, okay, God, yeah, I think I need a clever wife to produce a clever child. No. I'm sorry, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. I've seen beautiful couples producing money to you. <laughs> you look at the child, you're like, oh yeah. Wait, what, what happened? <laughs> then I've seen funny guys, now they produce. <laughs> it's what you see. Tell your neighbor, it's what you see. If you don't see your wife beautiful, you'll never produce beautiful children. I'm not saying if she's not beautiful. I say if you don't see her beautiful. If you don't see your, hun- your husband handsome. I didn't say if he's not handsome. I said if you don't see him handsome, you will not produce. Yes. You have to create a, a better version of him. And then imagine it. Then conceive. I'm helping somebody. Tell your neighbor I'm receiving strength to conceive in the name of Jesus. And that's the truth. In every aspect of life. Before your success in school, conceive it. Before your success in business, conceive it. Before you're the best at your workplace, conceive it. I remember those days we used to sit in the bank and then guys start speaking bank language, semantics only. And then you're like, oh my God, what am I doing here? The company is solvent by this. And then then you're like, "Eh, when did these chaps learn all these things? Then you go back in the room and say, even me, I know those things. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Then one day you say a word, a certain bank word. Even your manager says, what is that? Then you start explaining. (laughs) But you have to see it. You have to see it. You have to see it. Because let me tell you something. Let Let me tell you something. When a man starts to see a certain way, now I'm talking about the womb, which is loved. It starts to prepare a certain way. That, that's why women have your issues. You have issues. Why? Because your wombs are always prepared. If a woman's womb is not prepared, that woman can't have child. You understand? Even before the word comes, there is a way it prepares itself. And that's how you're supposed to be. Even when you're reading the word. When you sit in the word, create a certain... Expectation. When you're entering a room, say, God, I'm not coming out the same way I came in. But how do barren wombs come in? They say, Oh, but will you call me out to God? Oh, but will I see anything? God, it's up to you. If you are going to help me, you'll help me. If you are not going to help me, you're killing your womb. You're killing it. Your words are killing it. You're forgetting how much he loves you. Jesus never gathered men and did nothing. Don't ever expect you're going to come to Fanera and go back the same way you came. 
get it out of your head. It's impossible. This is the word of God. It's the word of God. The Bible says that he sent a word through Jacob and lit up Israel. That's what the word Bible, the Bible says. When God sends out a word into Jacob, it has lighted up Israel. Every word you hear takes you to another level. That's what the Bible says. And as we behold, like in the mirror of the glory of God, we are metamorphosed. You know the metamorphosis stage? You know metamorphosis? From lava to what? To pupa. To what? You see? So that means everything you hear takes you from one level to another level. My biggest mandate is to make sure that in the light of the Spirit, I carry what is Rema for everyone. That everyone walks out of this room when something has hit their spirit. That's the only way I can minister to each one of you. I'm speaking words, but everyone is speaking, is speaking their own light. All lights, plural. Everyone is speaking. Someone, that's why you come out of me and say, you are speaking to me. No, even the next one will start speaking to them. Even the other one will start speaking to them. Even the other one. Why? Because that's the essence of Rema. That's the message of a land spirit. You know how to speak a word to him that is weary. In season. That particular season, you know the house of approaching it. That's the gospel. So when they hear, they'll come back. Why? Because you're giving them answers. You're giving them answers. You're giving them answers. You're giving them answers. Those things start to change their lives. You have to learn to prepare. When any barren person, even when somebody, even when somebody says, I'm barren. It's like one time a woman, I was praying for a little girl. And then, eh, my mind is in things. I was praying for a little girl one time. And then the Lord shows me a sister who had been barren for many years. So I said, you have a sister who's barren? Yeah, she's called Barbara. I said, okay, can I meet her? So I bring the lady, I ask her, how, do, how long have you been uh, buried? She says, I've been buried for eight years. I said, so what do you want? You want a girl or a boy? She says, I want a boy. I told her, Barbara, after praying, tomorrow morning, let's go and buy clothes. <laughs> after prayer, Barbara went and bought blue stuff. It actually produced a boy. Because you, you have to learn to prepare. You learn to prepare. That's the only way you can make an unbarren a barren womb, unbarren. Because the love of God promises you things, isn't it? It's the guarantee of the things that are promised and the fulfillment of those things. Because His love is in you. He has set His love on you. There is no way that love cannot fulfill. So what do you do? Your work is simple. To, 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 to make function what is barren in your spirit, you have to learn to create the space for what you want to receive. Isaiah 54. Give me the message. Hey, yeah. He says, sing. <laughs> Some they just cry. You see, but so the barren ones, I know cry. What does it say? Sing. What? Barren woman who has never had a what? A baby. It's all part of it. Imagine God finds you barren. And you are barren. No, 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 don't, don't cry. Sing. Oh, barren woman. He says, who has never had a baby? Fill the air with song. You who never experienced childbirth, you're ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. He's not talking about only physical. Hey! Next verse. He says, clear lots of grounds for your tents. Are you hearing me? That's what you do. You clear lots of ground for your tents. Are you hearing me? And then make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. Don't plant small. You expand your tent. You tell yourself next year I'm not living in this house. You know, there's a problem with Christians who learn. You know, I'm sorry, I'm going to dispel something. It's stupid, but I've seen many Christians using it. Listen, eh? when you become born again, eh? Get rid of personal budgets. I know it might seem wise to some of you who have no more money. You know everyone in their own right, they think they are rich. You understand? Somebody drives 10 million and drives a car and says, Hey, guy, Mugaga, he has a car. No, that's a second-hand car. It's $3,000. That's not money. Listen. When God says, I have plans, budgets, good plans for you, good budgets for you, to make you prosper and not to harm you, to give you that future, 
that hope, an expected end. It means God's budget is against your expectation. You can't budget with faith. Faith is not budgetable. It's exceedingly abundantly above. What am I trying to say? It's okay for you to plan to eat 20,000 a day. But it's also okay for you to believe God to make a million dollars every year. It's possible. You have to believe it. Ah, this guy doesn't know. You see, I'm not saying don't plan. I'm only saying don't plan to a place where you will limit God to work. Because you must work on a budget. Me, I'm on a budget. I give in a budget. I pray on a budget. I spend on a budget. That is why you look budgeted. Listen, God says, I have good budgets to make you what? Prosper. What is God's budget? Okay, you, you have a budget, but what's his budget? What's his plan? Okay, you, you have a plan on how you want to spend your money. But what is his plan for you? That's why I tell Christians, you must enter the God dream for you. I know you have personal dreams, but what about what God dreams for you? He says exceedingly, beyond your wildest dreams, prayers, and desires. He says he can do even beyond your wildest budget. He says, he says now to him who is in, 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 in by consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us, he is able to carry out his purposes and do superabundantly far above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, and budgets and dreams. He can do even above your budget. God can surprise you and you plan to spend a hundred thousand and then he gives you way more. But you must expand your tent. Tell God even if I'm using this, this is not my budget. This is not my budget. This is a temporary thing. I don't limit you by what I think I'm supposed to receive. God can give you above what you even think you can budget for. That is God. Sometimes barrenness comes when you limit yourself to what you think you have to live under and then fail to move in the purpose of God because you're too desperate to fix yourself than fix yourself in his dream. God is bigger than 100,000. Are you hearing me? He's way bigger. We started Fanero in negative. But we started. We didn't wait for the money to accumulate to start. No. God brought it. How? Because why is you told him for us, let us go. You'll find us there. You understand? It's called faith. If we had budgeted, how are we going to do it? We are not going to do it. We shifted from the, 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 the whatever. We came here. It was faith to come into the arena. Because what we were receiving was not equal to that. This year we received four times more than last year. You understand? Because we choose to believe. We choose to believe. I was telling people last year, we were looking for money to fix a lot of things. We bought land for the first church in Matuga. Right? We bought land for another church in Mokono. We bought land for Christ's heart. We contributed. We, we gave money to a church building, another church building in Kansanga. We gave money to the Irene Glesson while we were needing. Why? Because we refused to put our eyes on what we needed. We refused. We refused. We refused. And we paid off lands. There are churches, three of them wrote, and they said we paid off fully. Some of them, we paid all the amount they owed them. All of it. And don't think that we didn't also think, okay, now I think we need to buy more of this. No, there were other things to buy. But we did not look at our budget to say, now, because we have mega resources. We, no, no, no. We think big. We think big. And that is not going to hold back our hand to say, oh, because, because we, 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 have, we, 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 we want to buy this, so we want to buy that, therefore we also have to hold back. No, we will even give more. We will even give more. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Every weekend we're in the prisons. Every weekend we're in the prisons. We preach the gospel there every weekend. Every weekend. To those who, we are their own family. These guys know Fanero only as their own family. Some of them, their families that abandon them. And we have to believe. We send them whatever we buy them, things they need to use in the church. Be why do we do that? Because we believe. We believe. We believe. We believe. That's the life of faith. 
That's the life of faith. But some of you say, Reba, uh, 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 you see, I have to budget. I, I know a man who used to budget. Right now he's broke. I know him very well. I'll not tell you his names because but locally you gossip a lot. I'm only trying to say, plan what you can, but don't ever limit God on your plans. He's bigger than those plans. Somebody say amen. So, he says, make your tents what? Larger. Wait. And he says, spread out. That's a womb that, 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 that is preparing fertility. You understand? That's a womb that is preparing to receive seed. He says, think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. And he says, next verse, you're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. Oh, oh you're going to take over whole nations. And they're not even saying amen. Ah, you're going to resettle abandoned cities. Somebody say amen. Don't be afraid. You're not going to be what? Embarrassed. I know that you have three pieces in your shop. But expand it. <laughs> Some one time sent me a message and told me, Apostle, people are not buying stuff in my shop. I told him, buy more stuff and stock. But Apostle, how can I stock people what people are not buying? I told him, told him you just buy more and stock. He says, you'll not be embarrassed. Don't hold back. You're not going to come up short. You'll forget all about that humiliation of your youth and the indignities of being a widow will fade from your memory. He says, for your maker is your bridegroom. His name, God of the angel armies. Your redeemer is the holy of Israel. And he says, he's known as God of the whole of the earth. You were like an abandoned wife, devastated with grief, and God welcomed you back like a woman, married young and then left, says your God. And he says, your Redeemer, God says, I left you, but only for a moment. Now, with enormous compassion, I am bringing you back. He says, in an outburst of anger, I turned my back on you, but only for a moment. That was before Christ came. But with lasting love that I'm tenderly caring for you. He says, this exile is just like the days of Noah for me. I promised then that the waters of Noah would never flood the earth. I'm promising you now, no more anger. No more dressing you down. For even if the mountains walk away and the hills fall off to pieces, my love won't walk away from you. My covenant commitment of peace won't fall away. The Lord who has compassion on you says so. He says, afflicted city, stone battered and pitied. I'm about to rebuild you with stones of turquoise. Lay your foundation with sapphires. Construct your towers with rubies. Your gates with jewels. And all your walls with precious stone. All your children will have God for their teacher. What a mentor for your children. He says, you will be built solid, grounded in righteousness, far from any trouble, nothing to fear, far from terror. It won't even come close. If anyone attacks your apostle grace, don't for a moment suppose that I sent them. If they in any should attack, nothing will come of it. I create the blacksmith who fires up his forge and makes a weapon designed to kill. I also create the destroyer. He says, but no weapon that can hurt you has ever been forged. Woo. Expand your tent. I don't know whether you're a businesswoman. Instead of saying, oh, this day's business is not good, just expand it. Start to prepare like something big is coming up. Expand your faith, pastor, man of God. Expand your faith. Expand your faith for your ministry. Expand your faith for your family. Expand your faith for your health. Expand it. Make the tent large. He says, I will not embarrass you. Get a bigger room. People will come. I will not embarrass. That's a womb that is alive. When your womb is alive, you start to prepare your spirit. Every day, you walk in preparation. You walk in preparation. You walk in preparation. Start acting like you're going to have a big ministry. Do it now. Don't wait until tomorrow. 
I remember back in those days for us when we were believing God for, mirror, for, for whatever. By the way, we've not yet I told people Fanir hasn't yet started. When it starts, you'll understand. We saw choirs of 300 people. We tell you increase. I remember those days we used to be in rooms in Mokono back in those days in a small little building of global whatever. We used to tell people, reduce the volume. Can you increase this? Those who are watching us on live streaming, when there was nothing in the room, we still prepared our tents. And somebody think we can just break. Are you hearing me? We expanded our tents very early. Very early. This is too small. The other day we entered La Bonita with Pastor Zach and we repented. We tell God to forgive us. How could we have begun here? Oh my God. Oh my God. We repented. You understand? Even this one, we are soon repenting. Very soon. Uh, some of you tomorrow when you enter your shops repent say Lord I'm sorry I'm so sorry how can I have only a two million dollars how can I have only five how can I only have sixteen million dollars how God I'm sorry repent repent he says for ye shall lend to nations lending until born again Christians sign checks for governments. There's one pastor I read about in Nigeria. He lent the Nigerian government. I said, Yeah, this guy understands the gospel. <laughs> expand your tent. Tell your neighbor, expand your tent. Expand your tent. That's a fertile womb. Don't make it barren. By imagining impossibilities. Oh, I'm cutting down this. Don't cut it down. Make it bigger. But if it doesn't make business sense, as long as it makes God sense, God is business. Business is God. Come on. Come on. Believe God. It's called faith. It's called faith. It's called faith. Can you say words that just expand your tent? Just say something that your neighbor will hear and say, Are you mad? Mm. The Bible says in Psalms 113, verse 9, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be joy, a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Come on, speak in other tongues. Just take a minute and say something crazy about your life. Expand your tent by the word. I am bigger than what men see. I am bigger than Africa. I am bigger than Asia. I am bigger than Europe. I am bigger than the waters. Say something. Say something. In your life we shall see light. What do you see about your life? You're the richest. You're the wisest. You're the greatest. You're the most anointed. Oh, Ereba Salaba. You saying, are they over? As you were, you have met me here on earth. Are you out of words? There's nothing greater than me. That's why I love you forevermore. Remember the scriptures of men which are planting the seed? 
And then he said that there are some, they are not rooted. Okay? And then troubles come, tribulations come for the sake of the word. You see, it's, the, it's not coming because there's a problem, but it is coming because of the word they've had. It is too deep and the devil wants to get it out. And then they think it's an attack on them. It's on the word. Let me tell you, have you ever seen a car knocking a madman? They knock sin men. They don't knock madmen. You've never heard that they abducted, they, they abducted a, a street child and took him for sacrifice. They get those ones in homes, which they put baby jelly on. <laughs> so he says, uh, begin from verse 16. Verse 16. Give me the amplified. Amplified. It says, and in the same way, listen, the ones sown upon stony ground are those who, when they hear the word, at once they do what? It is working. And accept it and welcome it with what? And then they say, Preach, preacher. And the Bible says, and they have no real roots. Now, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing now, I'm giving you roots. Rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. He says, and they have no real root in themselves. And so, they endure for a little while. Then, when trouble or persecution arises, on account of the word, not because they have a problem, they immediately are offended. They become displeased and indignant and resentful. And then they stumble and fall away. They just stumble and fall away. So some people, the devil knows how to make them fall away. He just attacks the word in them. He doesn't waste time on anything around them. No. You, that's why some of you, you have to get ready to be attacked when you start hearing these things. And that it's not that... Me, there's a kid last time who came to me. She told me my father slapped me because I was coming to Fanero. And my elder brother came back at two drunk. And they laughed together. He laughed with a man from alcohol and slapped a child who was coming from prayer. From prayer. If she didn't come that day, maybe she would not have been slapped. And brethren, let me tell you, there are many things that attack you, they attack me, they attack all of us because of the word we believed. You... The man is overtaken by the abundance of revelation. And then a tormentor comes and buffets his flesh. But the other person does not understand that the buffeting is because the man knows too much. When you know too much, it will buffet you too. Let me see a babe judging Paul. And you're like, <laughs> have you ever seen Jesus? Have you ever seen Jesus with your eyes? And then the man is judging Paul. But Paul, Paul, eh, eh, first get to his revelation. Prove it, then judge Paul. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are people who go through things not because they are, they haven't, no, it's just an attack on the word in them. It's, it's just the word of God in them. And they need to find root. You understand? If they don't have root, they'll fall away. They'll stumble. They'll be resentful. And they'll be indignant. So there are people, the devil, it's very easy to flip you. Some of you, it's very easy to get you out of church. Very easy. Some of you, some, listen, but some people, it's very easy for somebody, very easy. They're even Christians. They have been believing for so long, but they are believing simply because something has not come challenging their faith. Some people can even leave the gospel. Oh. Let's go back. When you speak in other tongues and the Holy Ghost, God says, don't end there. In my relationship with you, He says, keep yourself in the what? The love of God. Regardless of what happens, understand that the love he has toward you cannot lead you to places to be destroyed. 
He loves you enough. The Bible says God has invested too much in Israel. One time somebody says, say it one time a word and say, Fanera is going to fail soon. Somebody said it. Somebody said, Fanera, it's only a matter of time. Listen, listen, listen. Some people don't understand Fanera. Fanera is not Apostle Grace. Fanera is not Apostle Grace. Fanner is the word. And you can't convince someone that it's not going to happen. You can only watch them because this is forever. You can only watch because the Bible says his word endures. As long as truth is preached on this altar, I want to tell you, we will not fail. Can I say it again? As long as truth is preached on this altar, and every time the Bible is open, truth is preached, it doesn't matter who stands here. Fanero will never fail. God guards his truth. You see, some of you think that God is as emotional as you are. Listen, God guards his truth. He guards his truth. He guards his truth. God loves his word so much. He says he has exalted his word above his name. His name has to fail first for his word to fail. Fanero is people who believe the word. They can't just wake up tomorrow and fail. God has to fail too. God has to fail too. One time they arrested Paul. And they thought that by arresting Paul, they would put a stop to what was working in his life. Let me tell you. And, and the Bible says the gospel could not be hindered. The gospel is not hindered. You can't hinder the gospel. You can't hinder the gospel. You can't hinder the gospel. The gospel is stronger than all of us. No, 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 no. no. You cannot. He says, why in I suffer trouble? And it's okay, we can all suffer trouble as men of God. As an evildoer. And we can be evildoers. And two bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Nothing can bound the word and hold it and say, now this one. No. I can only make sure I preach it. Do you understand? That is why I don't have a problem attacking my person. Because I don't represent me. I don't represent me. I'm no longer preaching for me. Uh uh-uh. I represent the word of God. Do you understand? That's, that's where, that's, that's, that's the true testimony by which we stand. Do you understand? So if somebody says that, let's wait and see. We cannot convince them. No. Because God does not convince men that he, he will not fail. Do you understand what I'm saying? This word could not, should not have come to us, but the moment it did... The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.